The paper stages changed a lot. Uh, in my book that I wrote, I've, I've got some pictures of the various iterations, one called a Christmas tree, which was stealthy and looked like a Christmas tree plan form wise, but was horrible at high angle attack. There's an example of the yin and yang between the, the competing designs. The LO design was great. The aerodynamic design was stinking. So the two had to get together and say, how are we going to solve this? And they changed the shape. So the, the, the Christmas tree only looks remotely like the YF-23. So there were changes. Uh, the, the more interesting one, I think, is the difference between the YF-23 and the F-23 and the YF-22 and the F-22. There you see refinements of the design. In general, they look, they look similar, but they definitely made engineering improvements on both of the production versions of those airplanes. So the second question then is, is who arbitrates those design decisions? So if you've got the you know, yin yang, the natural tension between LO and, uh, and aerodynamics, when they can't agree, who, who comes in and says, well, we're going to go with this or that? That's the job of the chief engineer. And when the chief engineer can't resolve it in terms of schedule or time, there's a program manager who makes these next level decisions of, well, you don't have time to change that. We got to go with this. So it's a, it's a hierarchy of authority that reacts to changes. I just wonder sort of how easy it was to work on this kind of stuff. Did you, you know, do you think of the something like the F-117 and you can kind of understand why they were, you know, there were drapes between, you know, sort of where they were building it and, you know, very, very, you know, sort of careful not to let anyone see it. But, you know, the F-20, the ATF program, let's say the, the YF-23, YF-22, that, that that was tested in public, uh, you know, for one of, of a better description. It wasn't tested in a, in a, in a sort of black context. So, uh, you know, I just wondered if it that made life easier, if, if the constraints of something like the F-117 would have put some additional strain on on the development process i wasn't directly involved with the f-117 test process so i don't i don't really know but there there are there are some things that slow you down or constrain you uh, but uh, for whatever reason the air force decided to take the uh, atf public uh, with at least some notional drawings initially provided to the press to bring it in to the, uh, the white world if you will but there was still a lot of technology that was classified even though the public could see pictures of the airplane what about the uh, you know the efforts of your competitors then my, my understanding is that you know the air force you know doesn't share the, the designs there's no sort of technology sharing between what they're looking at from one defense contractor and uh, you know or another defense contractor did you you know were you are you in any way interested what the other guy's doing are you in any way curious well i wonder if he's or she's you know designing the airplane in the same way or, or what we're going to be up against does 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 what the other person's doing have a bearing on what you're doing? Well, you're obviously being human beings. You're you're curious and you, you're being challenged with a program that could be worth billions of dollars. So there's certainly a question of how how those guys doing. Do they have any problems and what's their design look like? Uh, sure, that's that's just natural human beings. But uh, no, we uh, we remained uh, pretty isolated. I. Dave Ferguson was the chief test pilot for Lockheed at the time. And uh, one of the things was we were physically and, uh, and intellectually separated physically from the other team and could not discuss with them. But Dave and I got together as chief test pilots. And we said, look, Dave, we know we can't talk to each other about what we're doing. But if there's a common problem that affects us that could affect our air crews, for example, we all both have the same kind of engine, same Pratt & Whitney and Pratt & GE engine. If we have a problem, we're going to get with the other guy and tell him what's going on with his problem. So we don't have a chance of one of our people getting hurt. And that was our agreement. And uh, we had to do that one time. But otherwise, it was hands off, eyes closed, no discussions. And, and we, we followed that. Do you think, I mean, they are different designs. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to get to a point where we make, and make any assertions about there being copying or, or anything inappropriate like that. But do you think it was inevitable that the design similarities between the two platforms would be there was there, do they speak to the fact you know you've got the sort of outward canted tailplanes uh, or stabs uh, maybe as you call them that sort of uh, well you'll describe <laughs> you'll describe the design properly but a sort of trapezoid type wing um, do you think that's a, that's just what stealth or low observable designs look like at that time um, so it was kind of inevitable you'd end up 
going with you know sort of similar approaches or you know you've just described faceting as as one approach but there are many others was there the potential that you'd actually come out with quite different quite different designs well when you have there's specifications or requirements if you will one of which was you must carry certain weapons internal to the airplane so that starts to define the form and shape of the airplane to carry weapons of a certain size internally. Uh, if you want Mach 2 capability, that determines uh, aerodynamic shaping and coefficients of drag and so forth. So it doesn't surprise me that you didn't wind up with radically different designs between the two companies. Although I would, I would suggest that to me, the YF-23 looks different than the YF-22. Uh, so the unique assembly of the pieces resulted in two different looking airplanes. But in the words of the Secretary of the Air Force, when they awarded the contract, both airplanes met the requirements. They had greater faith that Lockheed could execute the program from a management point of view. And that, that was their public announcement. And I have never, I've never seen anything else in writing over, over a period of time that was different from that pronouncement. Sort of skipping ahead to the end of, of that particular story but but maybe maybe well as you've mentioned it will we can just sort of cover that off there and so uh, you did a fantastic presentation for uh, i think it's called is it the pennsylvania seniors it's betty, betty uh, pennsylvania seniors, she's this, yeah. it's one of my favorite youtube channels i love it uh, anyway so so uh, but i think you talked about that at the end of your your presentation uh, was there an element of pr then in the in the decision you know did lockheed just play a blinder as we'd say in the uk did they did they do just a great job of doing some pr and and, and making that case uh, you know, did you have a view on it well yeah I, you're referring to that uh, insular uh, talk that jim sandberg and i gave on the yf-23 uh, yeah I, I i i have felt and i mentioned in the talk that uh, there is a, a element of showmanship in these things you got to respect your customer may not be technically as astute as your engineers are. They are looking at the airplane as a whole. What does it do? What can it do? Does it appear to be a well thought out design? And part of the, the issue I, that I believe is that you do things in flight demonstration that catches the people's attention and accentuates whether you've got your arms around this design. Lockheed went up into high angle of attack testing to 60 degrees angle of attack. Now this is during the demonstration and validation program. So they did high angle attack testing. They shot missiles. They went to nine G's on their airplane. I can't tell you the number of people come up to me and said, Paul, did you know that the YF-22 pulled nine Gs and shot a missile at 60 degrees angle of attack? <laughs> no, I didn't actually know that. Well, they did not happen simultaneously. And they were, in retrospect, heart of the envelope kind of flying. They were not extremes. The missile launch was, was a benign type of condition. But on film, it looked really good. Mm. And Lockheed chose not to do those things. Not that they couldn't have done them, but they chose not to do them. Uh, it turns out that the YF-23 has the same 60-degree angle of attack capability that the YF-22 had. The YF-22 can be at zero airspeed and still pitch its nose because it has thrust vector. The YF-23 could not do that. However, it's inherently a stable airplane, and it's very stable high angle of attack. But none of that has a picture associated with it. Only Lockheed has a picture associated with it. And I have always felt that, that there is some element of the selection of an airplane that, that something, a show of capability leaves an impression with a potential customer that, hey, this thing can do this and this other thing can't. It wasn't that YF-23 can't, the YF-23 chose not to do it. We, we, we kind of, we, we definitely skipped the YF-23 <laughs> test flying a bit. So we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. But but let me just stay with this for, for the minute then, because I think it's, I'm, well, I'm keen to understand emotionally what that does to you. I mean, you're so first of all, you're a type A personality. You don't like losing. That's you know, probably a standard trait for uh, most fighter pilots. Uh, second of all, you're, you've invested all this brain power and, and sort of commitment, and uh, you have all this expectation around this, this program being good. You believe in it. How does it feel then to find out that you, do, you didn't win? what's the you know is, is it sort of crushing in the sense that you, you you when you see athletes who don't win a final or sports final you know sort of on the ground with their hands in their their heads in their hands is, is it that sort of experience i would say it must be i don't know what that it, athlete is feeling but yes it's uh, it's very discouraging uh, i mean i the yf-23 followed the f-20 hmm. it was a, a discouraging outcome 
Mm-hmm. So yeah, it is. But you okay. you can't you can't let that drag you down. You've got to get up to the next project and shake it off. And so does the athlete. But, so let's talk, let's talk about that at the airplane. Then how how would you describe it? If the the YF twenty three. How would you describe it? Well, these airplanes were in the fifty thousand pound class. Fifty. If, if I remember, the original specifications was fifty thousand pounds and thirty five million dollars a copy. That was the boundaries, and uh, it since busted those boundaries. But that was a, a box that they were built around, 50,000 pounds, $35 million a copy. The airplane was uh, optimized for stealth. It, it was a low observable, very low observable airplane. It was very clean, uh, taking off two of the aft surfaces, the empennage surfaces, and replacing it with the, the V-tails, uh, where it resulted in a very low coefficient of drag. So the airplanes were very fast. If you enjoyed this clip and want more, you can go to 10percenttrue.com, hit subscribe, and get early ad-free access to all my content. Appreciate your support.